itself to you. When insight expresses itself to you, it does come through your mind, but insights are coming from the inside or the other side, from whether it's our spirit guides or our deceased loved ones or our higher self or we, whatever we want to call it, our angels, God. But in order for that, that side to communicate to you, we need gaps in your thoughts, in your mind. And in today's information age, that's becoming harder and harder. Can you imagine your deceased lo loved ones, what they're thinking? They're like, what's wrong with these people? Because <laughs> the first thing we do is we go looking outside for answers, but no, let the answers come to you from inside. So this is why I wanted to take you on a guided meditation later and remember insights over information. Insights are always more powerful. Um, so I wanted to start with about start talking about the lessons I learned in the other realm. So what is the biggest lesson I learned that saved my life? The biggest lesson I learned was to love myself. It's as simple as that, to love myself. Love myself like my life depends on it, because it does. It's so simple and yet so hard for so many of us to do. And why is it so important? Because the lack of love or the absence of love, that space when you don't fill it with love, that absence of love is fear. We think fear is a thing in and of itself, but it isn't. Fear only exists where there is no love. We create fear by removing love. We're born knowing that we are love. We come from love. We return back to love. But something along the way here makes us forget, forget who we are. Who we are is love. When we are, when we are without these physical bodies, we are love. We are pure love because our pure essence is pure love. It's pure God. Why is it so important to remember, to love ourselves or remember that we are love? It's important because when you don't love yourself, you don't allow yourself to express who you are. When you don't love yourself, you believe that everybody else is better than you. Everybody else is more important than you. Everybody else's message is better than yours. That was me. That was who I am. I would make myself small so others could be big. I would dim my light so others could shine. That was me. I would say yes when I meant no. It was easier to disappoint myself than it was to disappoint other people. When I was in the other realm, and when I realized that I was pure essence, I was a facet of God, that's when I understood that if I don't love myself, then I don't allow myself to express who I am. What I'm doing is I am not allowing a facet of God to express itself through me. I am denying that facet of God from expressing itself through me here in this life. I have come here to allow that facet of God to express itself, and yet I am denying it. And what right do we have to deny that facet of God or consciousness to express itself through us? We don't have the right to do that. You don't have the right not to love yourself because you are an expression of God. You don't have the right to do that. And we get taught from a young age, love your neighbor as yourself. What happens when you don't love yourself? It doesn't work, does it? <laughs> Maybe that's why our world is in such a mess. Mm -hmm. So, when I had come out of the coma, 
and I started healing about five or six days after I, um, I'd come out of the coma. I was moved from the intensive care unit to a regular room. And I remember a nurse coming up to me and saying, it's time for me to start learning to walk again because my legs were now starting to build up strength, but she said, you have to start walking and using your legs. So she helped me out of my bed and she was holding me with one arm and I was holding the IV stand with the other arm, with my other hand, and we were walking across the room and she said, okay, is there anywhere you wanna go in the hospital, anywhere we can walk to? And I was walking slowly. And I said to her, you know what? I haven't looked at myself in the mirror for ages, like really weeks. So I said, would you take me to the bathroom so I can look in the mirror? She said, sure. She took me to the bathroom and I looked in the mirror and I got a shock because I really hadn't seen myself in a long time. And what I saw in the mirror, the person I saw was so different from how I remembered I looked because I was so thin and gaunt that my cheeks were completely sunken into my face. They were like almost hollow. And my eyes looked like they were too big for my head or my face. They looked like they were bulging out. And my hair had come out in big clumps. There was like all these bald patches. And my, um, I had these open skin lesions on my neck and I was like really seeing them properly, although part of them were bandaged up. But I looked at myself and I started crying because I felt I had done this to myself. Now, I'm not saying that it's anyone's fault if they have cancer or have had cancer or any illness. It's not their fault. It's not your fault if you're dealing with an illness. But yet what I felt looking at myself in the mirror, because I understood why I had had cancer, I felt that I had spent a lifetime of treating myself like a doormat, of making myself small, of always putting other people's problems before mine and believing that everybody's problems were more important than mine, believing that I was not worthy, believing that I didn't matter, believing that I wasn't good enough, that I had to always try harder, work harder. All these things over a lifetime, making every decision from a place of fear, fear of failure, fear of the consequences, rather than knowing that I was deserving or worthy. A lifetime of treating myself that way, beating myself up, dimming my light. I felt a lifetime of doing that had led me to finally getting cancer. <coughs> and in that moment, when I saw myself, and I saw what I had done to myself, I started crying. And I even put my hand up to the mirror, I put my hand up to my face, and I said to myself that I am never going to do this to you again. I am never going to treat you like a doormat even if other people do. I'm never going to let you down. I'm never going to forsake you. Even if you fail, even if you fall flat on your face, even if you disappoint other people, I am going to be my own best friend. And I made that commitment on that day. That was 11 years ago. And I stuck with it. And I invite you to do the same. I invite you to do the same. Make that same commitment to yourself from today, from this moment on. The least you can do is to be your own best friend. Your own best friend. Most of us treat our friends better, way better than we treat ourselves. <laughs> and think about it, the way you've been treating yourself 
if you were your best friend, you would have got rid of that friend. <laughs> you would have been saying, oh my God, that's a toxic friendship. I to stay away from, from that person. But no, we, it's time to completely change that and truly treat yourself the way you would treat somebody who you cherish and love. Treat yourself like you would treat your own child or your own pet with love. So the biggest lesson I learned was the importance of loving myself. So people ask me, but how can I put myself first or love myself or do things if other people around me are suffering? So let me tell you how it works. We're all connected. You feel what I feel, I feel what you feel, right? <laughs> and we know that. I can give you scientific proof of that. I can say, um, you know, there's a term for it. It's called entrainment. There are tests that have been done where they put four or six women in an apartment together <coughs> and found that after three or five months, their menstrual cycles started aligning with each other. Um, and it's because we're all connected. We feel what we feel and we start to entrain ourselves with each other. So here's the thing. If this is the case and we accept that, that we're all connected, that's why we sometimes have ESP, we can feel the thoughts or know what somebody's going to say. And, um, if we accept that, then if you are somebody who is always hurting, not tending to yourself, always putting yourself last, if you are somebody who has trouble receiving, so you become extremely needy, and you have this big giant hole where your heart is that constantly needs to be filled by other people because you need validation, because you don't love yourself and you don't think you're worthy or valuable, if you are that person, and then you go to help someone else who is needy, how helpful are you really? Because the people around you, they feel what you feel. So let me ask you this question. Now imagine if you are somebody who knows how to love yourself, who knows how to be joyful, who knows how to be fulfilled and happy and joyful, and you live this amazing life that you love and you're bubbly and you, and you just are so happy that you just want to share it with everyone you know. You're not needy at all. In fact, you have so much that you want to share it with everyone. Now between that person and the needy person who has this big hole that needs to be filled, who would you rather sit next to? <laughs> who would you rather have visiting you in the hospital if you're sick and tired and drained? People who are vulnerable, who are sick, especially children, they can sense your energy. So even if you are so selfless, loving yourself is also a form of being selfless to the people around you. Because wherever you go, you bring yourself with you. You bring yourself with you. Your presence is what changes your surroundings. So if you bring a fearful, needy self with you out into the world, that is what you're contributing towards. If you bring a fulfilled, joyful self with a light that's shining so bright, that's what you bring out into the world with you. So you're actually doing a service to the world when you love yourself and shine your light bright.